Storm Boy by Colin Thiel. Storm Boy lived between the Kurong and the sea. His home was the long, long snout of sand hill and scrub that curves away southeastwards from the Murray mouth. A wild strip it is, windswept and tussocky, with the flat, shallow water of the South Australian Kurong on one side and the endless slam of the Southern Ocean on the other. They call it the 90 mile beach. From thousands of miles round the cold, wet underbelly of the world, the waves come sweeping in towards the shore and pitch down in a terrible ruin of white water and spray. All day and all night they tumble and thunder. And when the wind rises up, whips the sand up the beach and the white spray darts and writhes in the air like snakes of salt. Storm Boy lived with Hideaway Tom, his father. Their home was a rough little humpy made of wood and brush and flattened sheets of iron from old tins. It had a dirt floor, two blurry bits of glass for windows and a little crooked chimney made of stove pipes and wire. It was hot in summer and cold in winter and it shivered when the great storms bent the sedges and shrieked through the bushes outside. But Storm Boy was happy there. Hideaway was a quiet, lonely man. Years before, when Storm Boy's mother had died, he had left Adelaide and gone to live like a hermit by the sea. People looked down their noses when they heard about it and called him a beachcomber. They said it was a bad thing to take a four-year-old boy to such a wild, lonely place. But Storm Boy and his father didn't mind. They were both happy. People seldom saw Hideaway or Storm Boy. Now and then they sailed up the Kurong on their little boat, past the strange wild inlet of the Murray Mouth, past the islands and the reedy fringes of the freshwater shore, past the pelicans and ibises and tall white cranes, to the little town with a boy with a name like a water bird's cry, Guruwa. There, Storm Boy's father bought boxes and tins of food, coils of rope and fishing lines, new shirts and sandals, kerosene for the lamp and lots of other packages and parcels until the little boat was loaded like a junk. People in the street looked at them wonderingly and nudged each other. There's Tom, they'd say, the beachcomber from down the coast. He's come out of his hideaway for a change. And so, by and by, they just nicknamed him Hideaway, and no one even remembered his real name. Storm Boy had got his name in a different way. One day, some campers came through the scrub to the far side of the Kurong. They carried a boat down to the water and crossed over to the ocean beach. But a dark storm came towering in from the west during the day, heaving and boiling over Kangaroo Island and Cape Jarvis past Granite Island and the Bluff and past Port Elliot until it swept down towards them with lightning and black rain. The campers ran back, ran back over the sand hills through the flying cloud and the gloom. Suddenly one of them stopped and pointed through a break in the rain and mist. Great Scott! Look! Look! A boy was wandering down the beach all alone. He was as calm and happy as you please stopping every now and then to pick up shells or talk to a hawk standing forlornly on the wet sand with his wings folded and his head pointed into the rising wind. He must be lost, cried the camper. Quick, take my things down to the boat. I'll run and rescue him. But when he turned round, the boy had gone. They couldn't find him anywhere. The campers rushed off through the storm and raised an alarm as soon as they could get back to town. Quick! There's a little boy lost down by the beach, they cried. Hurry or we'll be too late to save him. But the postmaster at Goulois smiled. No need to worry, he said. That's little Hideaway's boy. He's the boy you saw in the storm. And from then on, everyone called him Storm Boy. The only other man who lived anywhere near them was Fingerbone Bill, the Aboriginal. He was a wiry, wizened man with a flash of white teeth and a jolly black face as screwed up and wrinkled as an old boot. 
he had a hump tea by the shore of the Kurong, about a mile away. Fingerbone knew more about things than anyone that Stormboy had ever known. He could point out fish in the water and birds in the sky when even Hideaway couldn't see a thing. He knew all the signs of wind and weather in the clouds and the sea, and he could read all the strange writing on the sand hills and beaches, the scribbly stories made by beetles and mice and bandicoots and anteaters and crabs and birds' toes and mysterious sliding bellies in the night. Before long, Stormboy had learnt enough to fill a hundred books. In his humpy, Fingerbone kept a disorganised collection of iron hooks, wire netting, driftwood, leather, bits of brass, boat oars, tins, rope, torn shirts, shirts and an old blunderbuss. He was very proud of the blunderbuss because it still worked. It was a muzzle loader. Fingerbone would put a charge of gunpowder into it. Then he'd ram anything at all down the barrel and fix it in there with a wad. Once he'd found a big glass marble and blew it clean through a wooden box just to prove that the blunderbuss still worked. But the only time Stormboy ever saw Fingerbone kill anything with it was when a tiger snake came sliding through the grass to the shore like a thin stream of black glass barred with red hot coals. As it slid over the water towards his boat, Fingerbone grabbed his blunderbuss and blew the sm snake to pieces. Number one bad fellow, Tiger Snake, he said. Kill him dead. Stormboy never forgot. For days afterwards, every stick he saw melted slowly into black glass and slid away. At first, Hideaway was afraid that Stormboy would get lost. The shore stretched on and on for 90 miles, with every sand hill and bush and tussock like the last one. So that a boy who hadn't learned to read the beach carefully might wander up and down for hours without finding the spot that led back home. And so Hideaway looked for a landmark. One day he found a big piece of timber lying with the driftwood on the beach. It had been swept from the deck of a passing ship and it was nearly as thick and strong as the pile of a jetty. Hideaway and Fingerbone dragged it slowly to the top of the sand hill near the humpy. There, Hideaway cut some notches in the wood for steps and fixed a small cross piece to it. Then they dug a deep hole, stood the pole upright in it and stamped it down firmly. There, said Hideaway, now you always have a lookout post. You'll be able to see it far up the beach and you won't get lost. As the years went by, Stormboy learnt many things. All living creatures were his friends, all that is, except the long narrow fellows who poured themselves through the sand and sedge like glass. In a hole at the end of a burrow, under a grassy tussock, he found the fairy penguin looking shyly at two white eggs. And when the two chicks hatched out, they were little bundles of dark brown down as soft as dusk. Hello, Mrs. Penguin, said Stormboy each day. How are your bits of thistle down today? Fairy penguin didn't mind Stormboy. Instead of pecking and hissing at him, she sat back sedately on her tail and looked at him gently with mild eyes. Sometimes, in the hollows behind the sand hills, where the wind had been scooping and sifting, Stormboy found long white heaps of seashell and bits of stone, ancient mussels and cockles with curves and whirls and sharp broken edges. An old midden, said Hideaway, left by the Aborigines. What's a midden? A camping place where they used to crack their shellfish. Fingerbone stood for a long time gazing at the great heaps of shells, as if far off in thought. Dark people eat, make camp, long time ago, he said a little sadly. No white fellow here then, for hundreds and hundreds of years, only black fellows. Stormboy looked at the big heap of shell and wondered how long ago it might have been. He could paint it in his mind, the red campfires by the Kurong, the pickaninnies, the songs, the clicking of empty shells falling on the piles as they were thrown away. And he thought to himself, if that time were now, I'd be a little black boy. 
but his father's voice roused him and he ran down to the beach to help dig up a bag full of big cockles for their tea. And when they had enough for themselves, they filled more bags to take up to Gulwa, because they were the fishermen and the tourists who would eagerly pay money to hide away for fresh bait. Stormboy stood bent over like a horseshoe, as if he were playing leapfrog. His fingers scooped and scraped in the sand, and the salt sea slid forwards and backwards under his nose. He liked the smell and the long, smooth swish of it. He was very happy. Stormboy liked best of all to wander along the beach after what Hideaway called a big blow. For then, all kinds of treasure had been thrown up by the wind and the wild waves. There were where the wide stretch of beach was shining and swishing with the backward, backward wash, he would see the sea la laying things as if they had been dropped on a sheet of glass. All kinds of weed and coloured kelp, frosty white cuttlefish, sea urchins and starfish, little dead seahorses as stiff as starch and dozens of different shells, helmets, mitres, spindles and dove shells, whelks with purple edges, ribbed and spiral cluster winks, murex bristling out their frills of blunt spines, nautilus as frail as frozen foam, and sometimes even a new cowrie gleaming and polished, with its underside as smooth and pink as tinted porcelain. In places the sand would be rucked and puckered into hard smooth ripples like scales. Stormboy liked to scuff them with his bare soles as he walked, or balance on their cool curves with the balls of his feet. He grew up to be supple and hardy. Most of the year he wore nothing but shorts, a shirt and a battered old Tom Sawyer hat. But when the winter came sweeping up from Antarctica with ice on its tongue, licking and smoothing his cheeks into cold flat pebbles, he put on one of his father's thick coats that came down to his ankles. Then he would turn up the collar, let his hands dangle down to get lost in the huge pockets and go outside again as snug as a penguin in a burrow. For he couldn't bear to be inside. He loved the whip of the wind too much and the salty sting of the spray on his cheeks like a slap across the face and the endless hiss of the dying ripples at his feet. For Stormboy was a Stormboy. Some distance from the place where Hideaway and Fingerbone had built their humpies, the whole stretch of the Courant and the land around it had been turned into a sanctuary. No one was allowed to hunt the birds there or hurt them. No shooters were allowed, no hunters with decoys or nets or wire traps, not even a dog. And so the water and the shores rippled and flapped with wings. In the early morning, the tall birds stood up and clapped and cheered the rising sun. Everywhere there was the sound of bathing, a happy splashing and shooshing and swishing. It sounded as if the water had been turned into a bathroom five miles long, with thousands of busy fellows gargling and gurgling and blowing bubbles together. Some were above the water, some were on it and some were under it. A few were half on it and half under. Some were just diving into it and some just climbing out of it. Some who wanted to fly were starting to take off, running across the water with big flat feet, flapping their wings furiously and pedalling with all their might. Some were coming into land with their wings breaking hard and their big webbed feet splayed out ready to ski over the water as soon as they landed. Everywhere there were crisscrossing wakes of ripples and waves and splashes. Stormboy felt the excitement and wonder of it. He often sat on the shore all day with his knees up and his chin cupped in his hands. Sometimes he wished he'd been born an ibis or a pelican.